Hello YouTube. Uh, well, my dad is a Christian still, and uh, he knows that I don't consider myself to be. He thought that it would be a cool idea to pick up this book at a sale at the library and give it to me uh, to try to provide a balance to some of the books I've been reading and letting him know about, uh, which he would consider a little skeptical or liberal for his taste. Uh, this book was The Divine Inspiration of the Bible by Arthur W. Pink. So Arthur Pink is a fairly well-reputed Calvinist theologian in the United States. Um, I know some church folk on Facebook who like to quote Arthur Pink like they quote scripture. And I thought it would be an interesting undertaking too, like how Agent of Doubt is reading Love Tells the Truth by Daryl L. Heath on his channel, um, that I would read this book and upload it to YouTube. So this would be a first time reading of this book, other than the table of contents and the first page of the introduction. I know this is going to have a very narrow audience, so if you don't want this book read to you, I am going to try to put up additional content over the next two weeks or so uh, because I'm planning on reading one chapter a day and there's 14 chapters to this book. So let's get started. Table of Contents Chapter 1 There is a presumption in favor of the Bible. Chapter 2 The perennial freshness of the Bible bears witness to its divine inspirer. Chapter 3. The unmistakable honesty of the writers of the Bible attests its heavenly origin. Chapter 4. The character of its teachings evidences the divine authorship of the Bible. Chapter 5. The fulfilled prophecies of the Bible bespeak the omniscience of its author. Chapter 6. The typical significance of the scriptures declare their divine authorship. Chapter 7. The wonderful unity of the Bible attests its divine authorship. Chapter 8. The marvelous influence of the Bible declares its superhuman character. Chapter 9. The miraculous power of the Bible shows forth that its inspirer is the Almighty. Chapter 10. The completeness of the Bible demonstrates its divine perfection. Chapter 11. The indestructibility of the Bible is a proof that its author is divine. Chapter 12. Inward confirmation of the veracity of the scriptures. Chapter 13. Verbal inspiration. Chapter 14. Application of the argument. Introduction. Christianity is the religion of a book. Christianity is based upon the impregnable rock of Holy Scripture. The starting point of all doctrinal discussion must be the Bible. Upon the foundation of the divine inspiration of the Bible stands or falls the entire edifice of Christian truth. If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? Psalm 11.3 Surrender the dogma of verbal inspiration, and you are left like a rudderless ship on a stormy sea, at the mercy of every wind that blows. Deny that the Bible is, without any qualification, the very word of God, and you are left without any ultimate standard of measurement and without any supreme authority. It is useless to discuss any doctrine taught by the Bible until you are prepared to acknowledge unreservedly that the Bible is the final court of appeal. Grant that the Bible is a divine revelation and communication of God's own mind and will to men and you have a fixed starting point from which advance can be made into the domain of truth. Grant that the Bible is, in its original manuscripts, inerrant and infallible, and you reach the place where study of its contents is both practicable and profitable. It is impossible to overestimate the importance 
of the doctrine of the divine inspiration of Scripture. This is the strategic center of Christian theology and must be demanded, defended, at all costs. It is the point at which our satanic enemy is constantly hurling his hellish battalions. Here it was he made his first attack. In Eden he asked, Yea, hath God said? And today he is pursuing the same tactics. Throughout the ages, the Bible has been the central object of his assaults. Every available weapon in the devil's arsenal has been employed in his determined and caseless efforts to destroy the temple of God's truth. In the first days of the Christian era, the attack of the enemy was made openly, the bonfire being the chief instrument of destruction. But in these last days, the assault is made in a more subtle manner and comes from a more unexpected quarter. The divine origin of the scriptures is now disputed in the name of scholarship and science, and that too by those who profess to be friends and champions of the Bible. Much of the learning and theological activity of the hour are concentrated in the attempt to discredit and destroy the authenticity and authority of God's Word, capital W. The result being that thousands of nominal Christians are plunged into a sea of doubt. Many of those who are paid to stand in our pulpits and defend the truth, capital T, of God, are now the very ones who are engaged in sowing the seeds of unbelief and destroying the faith of those to whom they minister. But these modern methods will prove no more successful in their efforts to destroy the Bible than, tho than did those employed in the opening centuries of the Christian era. As well might the birds attempt to demolish the granite rock of Gibraltar by pecking at it with their beaks. Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Psalm 119.89 now the Bible does not fear investigation. Instead of fearing it, the Bible courts and challenges consideration and examination. The more widely it is known, the more closely it is read, the more carefully it is studied, the more unreservedly will it be received as the Word of God. Christians are not a company of enthusiastic fanatics. They are not lovers of myths. They are not anxious to believe a delusion. They do not desire their lives to be molded by an empty superstition. They do not wish to mistake hallucination for inspiration. If they are wrong, they wish to be set right. If they are deceived, they want to be disillusioned. If they are mistaken, they desire to be corrected. The first question which the thoughtful reader of the Bible has to answer is, what importance and value am I to attach to the contents of the scriptures? Were the writers of the Bible so many fanatics moved by oracular frenzy? Were they merely poetically inspired and intellectually elevated? Or were they, as they claimed to be, and as the scriptures affirm they were, moved by the Holy Spirit to act as the voice of God to a sinful world? Were the writers of the Bible inspired by God in a manner no other men were in any other age of the world? Were they invested and endowed with the power to disclose mysteries and point men upward and onward to that which otherwise would have been an impenetrable future? One can readily appreciate the fact that the answer to these questions is of supreme importance. If the Bible is not inspired in the strictest sense of the word, then it is worthless, for it claims to be God's word, and if its, and if its claims are spurious, then its statements are unreliable and its contents are untrustworthy. If, on the other hand, it can be shown to the satisfaction of every impartial inquirer that the Bible is the word of God, inerrant and infallible, then we have a starting point from which we can advance to the conquest of all truth. A book that claims to be a divine revelation, a claim which, as we shall see, is substantiated by the most convincing credentials, 
cannot be rejected or even neglected without grave peril to the soul. True wisdom cannot refuse to examine it with care and impartiality. If the claims of the Bible be well founded, then the prayerful and diligent study of the scriptures becomes of paramount importance. They have a claim upon our notice and time which nothing else has, and beside them everything in this world loses its luster and sinks into utter insignificance. If the Bible be the Word of God, then it infinitely transcends in value all the writings of men, and in exact ratio to its immeasurable superiority to human productions, such is our responsibility and duty to give it the most reverent and serious consideration. As a divine revelation, the Bible ought to be studied, yet this is the only subject on which human curiosity does not desire information. Into every other sphere man pushes his investigations, but the book of books is neglected, and this not only by the ignorant and illiterate, but by the wise of this world as well. The cultured dilettante will boast of his acquaintance with the sages of Greece and Rome, yet will know little or nothing of Moses and the prophets, Christ and his apostles. But the general neglect of the Bible verifies the scriptures and affords additional proof of their authenticity. The contempt with which the Bible is treated demonstrates that human nature is exactly what God's word represents it to be, fallen and depraved, and is unmistakable evidence that the carnal mind is enmity against God. If the Bible is the Word of God, if it stands on an infinitely exalted plane all alone, if it is immeasurably transcends all the greatest productions of human genius, then we should naturally expect to find that it has unique credentials, that there are internal marks which prove it to be the handiwork of God, that there is conclusive evidence to show that its author is superhuman, divine, that these expectations are realized, we shall now endeavor to show that there is no reason whatever for anyone to doubt the divine inspiration of the scriptures is the purpose of this book to demonstrate. As we examine the natural world, we find innumerable proofs of the existence of a personal creator, and the same God who has manifested himself through his works has also revealed his wisdom and will through his word. The God of creation and the God of written revelation are one, and there are irrefutable arguments to show that the Almighty who made the heavens and the earth is also the author of the Bible. We shall now submit to the critical attention of the reader a few of the lines of demonstration which argue for the divine inspiration of the Bible.